My name is Jeremy Meldin. I should say right from the start that I know almost nothing about young Poland. I do, however, know a fair amount about the arts and crafts movement in general, particularly uh, in Britain. Uh, I'm an architectural historian by academic background. I'm a visiting professor at uh, UCL's Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Uh, and I am also the curator for the World Architecture Festival, uh, which is a celebration of contemporary architecture. So not really the subject of, of today. And we have quite a full program. So I'm not gonna to say too much more about myself. But this project, uh, the, the Young Poland project, uh, will be celebrated in an exhibition at the William Morris Gallery, which starts in October this year, and I think runs through to the very beginning of, of next year. So hopefully everyone who is in this meeting will have an opportunity to, to see that at some point. William Morris Gallery is in North London, and it's in what was Morris's childhood home. Uh, so there's a very strong connection there, both with Morris and, of course, through him uh, with the overall arts and crafts movement. And in the exhibition, there'll be all sorts of things uh, featured. There'll be um, arts and crafts architects, well-known ones from Britain, like uh, Philip Webb and Richard Norman Shaw, but also from Poland, Stanislaw Bikhetsvich, uh, uh, excuse my Polish pronunciation, and Karol Klozowski, um, both of whom uh, will feature in tonight's discussions. Um, and much of the work uh, in Poland was done in and around the village of Zakopane in the Tatra Mountains. And that seems to me to have been something like Chipping Camden, the Cotswolds town in England, which became a thriving center of the arts and crafts movement when um, uh, C.R. Ashby moved there in the late 19th century, but then many people followed him and it uh, became one of the centers of arts and crafts creativity for uh, long after Ashby had, had, had left. Now, um, I'm going to say just a very few words about the speakers now. I'll give a slightly longer introduction uh, before they actually speak. But our first speaker is Professor Andrzej uh, Sklerski, uh, who is the curator of the National Museum of Poland in Krakow, one of the co-curators of the overall Young Poland project. Um, and also an expert in uh, the reception of British art in Poland, about which he has written extensively. Our second speaker from the William Morris Gallery is Roisin Inglesby, uh, an expert in the arts and crafts movement who has uh, studied art and, and design and architecture, has worked at places like the Victoria and Albert Museum and also in um, um, Tokyo, uh, and her expertise, apart from the arts and crafts movement, is across design uh, and drawings. Then um, our third speaker is Anna uh, Wenda uh, Suniak, who is a curator of the Tatra Museum, uh, which has many different outposts across the Tatra Mountains in Poland, but one of them is in Zakopane, this village where, uh, which was the center of the Young Poland movement. Our fourth speaker is Julia Griffin, uh, who is also from the William Morris Gallery and one of the co-curators of the Young Poland Project and of the exhibition at the uh, William Morris Gallery. And uh, don't be confused by the surname, she is Polish by birth, so uh, we'll also be able to talk very much about from, from the perspective of a Polish person, a native speaker of Polish, uh, about uh, Poland, but also uh, from academic background and professional experience about the UK and about what went on in Britain. Um, our fifth speaker this evening is Nicholas Tremens, uh, uh, an art historian uh, who has specialized in 19th century British painting. And he's written amongst other people about uh, the uh, painters Jeff Watts and David Wilkie. Um, and he's going to talk about the problems of hanging paintings in an arts and crafts interior. Now, when all the talks are finished, we will have a short presentation uh, from uh, Lucy Clark from the publishers Lund Humphreys, uh, who published the book, Young Poland. And it is during that presentation that you will see the discount code that you can use uh, to get a discount if you would like to buy the book. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Andre Atzerski uh, to start uh, his uh, presentation, please, Andre. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening from Krakow. I'm very delighted to be part of the uh, London Festival of Architecture and uh, to be able to share with you some of my thoughts regarding the subject of the 
reception of British ideas, especially arts and crafts um, in Poland around 1900. We have very limited time, so we we'll stick to several key, key points um, in the presentation. First of all, there was a strong interest in British arts and architecture, broadly speaking, British culture around 1900 in Poland. This is a very much forgotten fact. And uh, in our sort of mindset, uh, how we think about geography of art in Europe at that time, you have a center in Paris radiating around the continent, and you have the provinces that really follow the Parisian path. However, in places like Central Eastern Europe, Poland included, there was a much broader interest in, um, in European uh, cultural centers. And um, in fact, you can talk about polycentric uh, European arts uh, life at that time, uh, as seen from the perspective of countries such as Poland, as they were really looking for a revival of art and its uh, stimuli uh, were coming from very different parts of Europe, including Britain. This is so quite unique, actually, because cultural contacts between Poland and Britain until then were quite scarce. And uh, despite the fact that Shakespeare is writing about Poland in Hamlet, there was not much uh, going on uh, in terms of cultural uh, exchange. So this is a quite unique moment. And it's worth remembering that, um, that uh, British culture has influenced strongly young Poland. And this is reflected in the title of our exhibition in the book, because we precisely frame young Poland movement, which is the revival of arts and crafts around 1900, as a version of arts and crafts or interpretation of arts and crafts principles from Britain. So that's the point number one. And how did it come about? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, there was a, a growing number of, as you see on the first slide, studies about Ruskin and Morris, uh, especially written in Polish or translated into Polish uh, by Polish authors. They especially proliferated around 1900 and later on after John Ruskin's uh, death, um, so posthumous appraisal but they were also quite important in the late 1890s. Uh, so here you have uh, books written by Polish authors that uh, like a survey books about Morris and Ruskin, where they are discussing basically the main points that they made, especially about arts and crafts, but also politics, uh, the social issues. Can I have a next slide, please? Um, there was also a, a fascination with Pre-Raphaelites, uh, pre raphaelite paintings, which basically went hand in hand with uh, interest in Ruskin and Morris. Um, here you have on the left uh, the reproduction of the catalog of a bookshop in, in Lviv, um, where you could buy the reproductions of uh, famous paintings by Rossetti, Ben Jones and others. Interestingly enough, some of them were uh, actually done by a Polish graphic artist uh, living then in Paris, Felix Jasinski, who was a favorite uh, etcher of Ben Jones, and he, he produced a number of uh, fabulous copies of uh, Edward Ben Jones in graphics. So there was also kind of Polish connection here. And on the right hand side, interestingly enough, there was also an interest on the British side in what was going on in Central Eastern Europe, including Poland. So the studio, for instance, had regularly published uh, uh, reports on, on art life uh, in this part of Europe, including my hometown, Kraków, which you see here on the left. It was written by Amalia Sara Levetus, an amazing person, uh, an art critic, a writer. Uh, um, um, she still deserves a bigger discovery, who was a studio correspondent in Vienna. Can I have a next slide, please? And last but not least, these contacts were uh, so strong and the interest in, in British culture was so much uh, proliferating that in fact, British artists found Polish clients. And uh, Hugh Bailey Scott was the favorite architect uh, of arts and crafts uh, that was known in Poland. And in fact, he got two commissions from Polish clients. None of these houses were actually built but he published them in his book, 1906, Houses and Gardens, uh, where he refers to um, a project called House in Poland, which as you see resembles, this is the, the house, resembles more or less a, a medieval castle or British cottage and uh, English cottage, uh, a black and white uh, cottage, and uh, nicely corresponds with the tradition of uh, 
and manor house architecture, sumptuous manor house architecture in Poland. So there was a, a so strong affinity that uh, that the Poles found um, found in, in British architects uh, the actual executors of their dreamlike home. Why why was it happening at all? Why Britain was so interesting for, for Polish uh, public and for Polish clients, for Polish general art lovers? I think that there were two reasons. First of all, Britain was seen as a country which successfully combined modernity with nationhood. In fact, the difference between the Paraphylite paintings especially uh, and the rest of the uh, rest of the Europe, but also the British arts and crafts architecture uh, showed that Britain, Britain found its own way towards modernity, looking very much and appreciating its vernacular roots or broadly speaking national roots. But in fact, the Brits produced a national art per se that was not only uh, well done, but it was also very much responding to the challenges of modern era. This was exactly what Poles were looking for, because to remind all of us uh, that Poland did not exist as a state on the map of Europe. The Polish nation lived in three different empires, uh, Russian, German, and Austrian, um, and they were struggling to preserve their identity, uh, referring to cultural roots, referring to, to national values. Yet, they were not so much sort of looking for retro utopias, but they were much hoping for revival of, of their nationhood, of regaining the independence. And they thought that if they are going to produce a, a culture that is both modern and national, they will achieve it. So Britain was a sort of a role model, especially because arts and crafts was so much interested in the local context, in the local material, a sense of place. So it was seen as an example of national art and modern because Britain was the powerhouse of the world. Britain was the most advanced uh, country in the world. So if this is happening in, in Britain, this is uh, something that's worth following. And secondly, the social message of arts and crafts was also very much intriguing for, for Polish public. Because uh, uh, the, the, uh, the idea of elevation of social classes the reference to uh, the uh, sort of uh, romantic uh, socialism of Morris, paradoxically nicely corresponded with Christian values that were so much widespread in Polish society. The idea of care for the others, the idea of care for, for those who are uh, uh, less fortunate, the idea of elevation of society, the elevation uh, uh, of, of different social classes to a kind of equilibrium. To, uh, but this was called in Polish case the national solidarity. It was also seen as a prerequisite for the advancement of, of social of social cause. So, and once the nation is united, it could regain its independence. So there's all sorts of meaning, uh, all sorts of messages that 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 Paul found attractive in arts and crafts. And last but not least, uh, also artistically, uh, the, the British vernacular architecture and design corresponded with what was fashionable or acceptable in Polish society, which we will see in due course. Can I see next slide, please? Um, there's, a whole, uh, uh, there's a whole variety of how Polish artists and designers, architects responded to British uh, influences or inspirations. Um, they were never directly copying British patterns. It's also important that they're all, always reworking them in, a, in an innovative way. This is Josef Mehofer, a decoration of an uh, Orthodox uh, Greek uh, Armenian uh, um, church in Lviv with his uh, mosaic that uh, refers to Paraphylite uh, interior decorations, uh, including uh, the patterns taken from Morris in, even uh, in his early works for interior design. Can I have the next slide, please? There was an interest in uh, we will hear about it more in, in, in a minute, uh, in architecture that was uh, based on vernacular um, sources like the Zakopane style. Uh, this is uh, Stanislaw Witkiewicz in the middle, the founder of Zakopane style, and Highlanders were the actual executors of the houses which he designed in arts and craft spirit because they precisely uh, followed the idea of handicraft, they followed the, the truth to materials, and they wanted to, uh, to, uh, base, to be based on the vernacular sources and elevate them into this architectural of new housing, uh, which you see on the left is a model of the most important house he ever designed in, in the new style. Can I have a next slide, please? 
And it all can be summarized, and this is my crucial point in the, for architectural historians most important, in the exhibition of 1912 in Kraków, where Polish arts and crafts um, circles uh, based in this city, mostly interior designers, but also architects, uh, art historians, they joined forces to present a model for architecture for the future based on the arts and crafts principles. Uh, this was all set in an exhibition uh, called Architectural Interiors in Garden Settings or in Gardens, organized in, the, in Kraków, which presented um, a, a future architecture of Polish countryside and Polish cities that was based on the models taken from Polish provincial architecture, vernacular folk architecture, but with the British touch, um, because the model here was the garden city of Ebenezer Howard, which also proved extremely influential in Poland and very much followed by the Polish uh, uh, architects. So this is the main pavilion of the exhibition. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, the most important in the exhibition was the presentation of four model houses for the future of uh, Polish uh, cities and Polish countryside. And interestingly enough, they were divided into four uh, social, social classes, still in the spirit that their architecture will be more or less similar to show the national unity based on the vernacular pattern. So this is a manor house for the gentry or upper middle class or aristocracy, you, you could say, uh, 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 based on the Polish traditional manor house, mostly with the neoclassicist elements. Next slide, please. There was a model for uh, craftsmen. Uh, it was a special category, a craftsman which was supposed to be urban dweller who will be an um, urban professional, but can also sustain its life by producing handicraft. So in pretty much Mauritian principles. So this is the house, as you see, it's also based on the um, models taken from Polish countryside, but it has surely the arts and crafts qualities in this loose uh, composition in the use of local materials. This was basically made mostly of wood and bricks. Next slide, please. There was a house for, uh, uh, for uh, it was called for provincial uh, residents. So that's for the smaller cities. Also a house that was supposed to be uh, both the place to, to live and place to work. There was a separate studio, so this model of handicraft was also incorporated into it. As you see, this is much more looking towards 20th century, it's much more simplified uh, and shows how much the arts and craft influences could also lead towards uh, modernity. And the next slide, please. And the last but not least, there was a, a, a cottage for uh, peasants. Uh, there was the biggest social strata in Polish society, the poorest. And this house was to be the most modest, but was supposed to fulfill all the needs for the decent housing, including the nice interior. So that was a setting for the countries and also to elevate the living status there. Let's see a few images about the interiors. From next, next slide, please. From sumptuous um, manor houses, uh, manor house interiors with um, really perfectly crafted uh, by local craft from Krakow and the area pieces of furniture. Including, including the stove and cabinet, uh, tables, chairs, with uh, quite expensive, uh, uh, quite expensive uh, wood uh, materials used to, to, to produce it. Next slide, please. This is the place for the um, Kratzner house. This is actually a, a separate room for children. This is the moment also when the importance for design for children is um, discussed in Poland. And this is a, a place where you see the special furniture design for children and also toys and bed. Okay, next, please. Uh, this is for the, this artisan uh, urban dweller. Here, the idea of simplification of, um, of uh, pieces of furniture is reflecting this uh, morality of design that was so important in arts and crafts. So not to be over sumptuous, um, rather to present the truth to material simplicity of life. This is following precisely the arts and crafts reception and dedicated for the, uh, for the much broader audience than the most, the most wealthy uh, part of the society. And it did work in Europe uh, in the same way. Um, so Poland in that respect is maybe following the, this path too. And the last but not least is the uh, peasant cottage. This is the kitchen. The kitchen was supposed to be functional, very well equipped in a, in a sense modern 
but uh, you know this could resemble the Scandinavian design of that period and uh, the idea of functional furniture that is based on the traditional uh, models that was that were found in the in the countryside in the wealthier cottages. So uh, as you see, the idea of uh, uh, of the individual house in garden setting taken from uh, from uh, Ebenezer Howard was regarded precisely as the epitome of the uh, interest in arts and crafts, because on the one hand, uh, the British uh, ideas uh, somehow um, emphasize the importance of locality, the importance of the value of, of things that were in Poland read as national. In the same time, they were read as the path to the future, uh, because this was precisely an antidote to the negative aspects of the 19th century city, and uh, the idea of the new type of, of uh, housing was to be a model for the, for the future Polish cities. And I have the final slide. Because what's the most uh, paradoxical also, and uh, I began with, with this national modern um, duality of the reception of arts and crafts, uh, and that was definitely the most important aspect of it. But in terms of architecture, interestingly enough, the, uh, the, you can also talk about certain internationalism of arts and crafts uh, influences. And here's a short story about a visit of Ebenezer Howard to Krakow in 1912, precisely to see the exhibition that I've all discussed with you. Here you see on the right hand side Ebenezer Howard surrounded by Polish architects and designers presenting him the exhibition which he definitely cherished. And he gave a talk uh, at this exhibition about the importance of uh, Garden City movement. And he gave it in Esperanto. Why he gave it in Esperanto? Because Howard was a staunch supporter of Esperanto. He believed very much in the idea of internationalism. And he thought that his, uh, his concept of Garden City is actually in, internationalist in its, in its form, because it was supposed to present a model to be uh, repeated around the world. And Esperanto was a perfect tool to, uh, to produce this image uh, and to, to uh, popularize his idea. And he found supporters in Krakow because Krakow was also, and the whole Poland was a, a place where, Polish cities were a place where Esperanto was fairly popular. This is a, on the left hand side, you see a poster for the ball for Esperantists organized in Krakow in 1911. So uh, 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 not, to, not, not to forget that the founder of Esperanto, Ludwig Zamenhof, was of Polish Jewish descent. So very much uh, the idea of Garden City and the vernacular inspirations for, uh, uh, for Poles were also seen uh, coming from Britain, also seen as a call for international model for architecture for 20th century. But if you re return to your roots, wherever you are, if you take this pattern as something that would be uh, uh, followed, uh, you could precisely build an international community that would, uh, that would appreciate the different local national uh, values, but they will speak the same language in the sense that arts and crafts will provide you this Esperanto type of language for architecture that, lo that looks, uh, looks uh, into its own roots, but in fact is repeating uh, uh, this attitude around the world. Right. That was my point uh, about British inspiration. Let's finish with Ebenezer Howard in Krakow. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Andre. And a fascinating um, thought at the end there about the sort of almost contradictory pulls between internationalism and Esperanto and Ebenezer Howard's ambitions for the Garden City movement and the, the Young Poland movement trying to establish um, a national identity. Uh, we might be able to explore this later, but we should move straight on to our next speaker, who is Roshin Inglesby, uh, as I mentioned earlier, an expert in the arts and crafts movement, and one of the uh, co-curators of the, of the Young uh, Poland project, uh, along with uh, Julia Griffin and Andre um, Skersky. And she works at the uh, William Morris Gallery, which will be the hosts for the exhibition later this year. Roshin, please uh, present your, your thoughts. Good evening. Uh, if I could just have the slides, please. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you very much for, uh, for listening to this. I'm just going to do a very quick um, romp through the arts and crafts movement in London because there's far too much to get through in sort of 12 minutes. Um, you'll see the title is Arts and Crafts Architecture and then the In London Bit is in brackets, which is just a caveat that I have tried to focus on London as this is the London Festival of Architecture, but a lot of the, the most spectacular arts and crafts architecture happens sort of a little bit outside London. 
Uh, so that's that's just the disclaimer before we start. Could I have the next slide, please? So what is the arts and crafts? What is arts and crafts architecture? Um, well, in a way, it's a contradiction of sorts. It's it's not really a style as such. Um, and you know, to think of arts and crafts as an architectural style like Gothic or Baroque, which is architecture defined by the use of aesthetic motifs um, within a particular time period, is to sort of miss the point of what arts and crafts um, architecture was all about. They deliberately uh, de sort of avoided these very uh, particular design elements, these very particular stylistic elements, and instead attempted to create an architecture that was flexible, it was fluid, and it was above all appropriate to its unique context. So that's, you know, it's, it can't be considered um, a style in the same way as Baroque um, or Gothic or anything else like that. However, of course, there are stylistic elements that then, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, can be sort of grouped together um, that do give you arts and crafts architecture. It's also a slight contradiction uh, because architecture being one of the traditional high arts sort of alongside sculpture, alongside painting, architecture has traditionally been considered, you know, a very respectable, a very fine art. And the arts and crafts movement was much more about celebrating the humble, the domestic, the vernacular. So things like textiles, furniture, ceramics. So arts and crafts architecture is it's not quite a contradiction because architecture was, you know, the, the mother of all of this for the arts and crafts uh, practitioners. But again, it's something that sits a little bit um, uneasily with the arts and crafts movement generally, which is much more focused on the small, uh, the domestic uh, and the everyday and the sorts of things you can hold in your hand. And finally, the arts and crafts movement, uh, sorry, go back to thank you. Finally, the arts and crafts movement um, is something that emphasized the role of handwork and the importance of the designer creator as one person. So the idea that the person who designs something should be able to see it through to its logical conclusion, should be able to make it. And this works fine in an embroidery, not so good in a huge country house. Um, you know, how could you possibly design and create something this big? Uh, and what you're seeing on the screen here is Standen, which was a house designed by Philip Webb, uh, who I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and this is just outside of London. Uh, and this was designed in the 1890s. So, you know, you can imagine the difficulty of one person designing and creating, you know, something of this magnitude. So having said this, architecture was an extremely important part of the arts and crafts movement. Now, despite all these contradictions, it was incredibly important. And it actually remains really influential on how we design, build and conserve buildings today. So that's you know, what I want um, to come across really here is that there's a set of principles um, rather than a, a style. And these principles continue to inform how we think about buildings. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's what I would say is the summary of, of what art, arts and crafts architecture is all about. Um, so I'm just going to go through now a little bit about the origins and then talk through some of these principles that I hope will then be relatable to a lot of other, you know, contemporary buildings and buildings that we see all around us. Next slide, please. So where did arts and crafts architecture come from? So it was it was a late 19th century movement, a mid to late 19th century movement, um, and it's certainly the biggest influence was undoubtedly the Middle Ages, both in terms of actual uh, historic medieval buildings, but also predominantly in the uh, the Gothic revival, which sought to replicate Gothic style buildings in all spheres of public life. So examples of this that you would see around London are, you know, George Gilbert Scott's Midland Grand Hotel uh, next, to, next to St Pancras Station and the law courts, the Royal Courts of Justice at the Strand, which is what you can see on your screen here. This was designed by George Edmund Street, uh, and we'll be talking a little more about him in a minute. Uh, and you can see on the right, you know, a design drawing and on the left, a, a caricature of, you know, the selected architect who got this very prestigious commission. But you can see, you know, this is this is Gothic. This looks like a medieval cathedral. It's very pointy. It's very spiky. There's lots of Gothic arches. Um, you know, it's very ecclesiastical in its tone. However, against this backdrop of Gothic revival, um, and sort of almost in contrast to it, actually, um, you know, the Gothic was a very, it was an imperial style, I would say. It was associated with Britain being a great power, uh, you know, a great industrial and a great colonial power. 
And arts and crafts architecture, like the movement of the, as a whole, was also born out of a frustration with this prevailing sort of um, language of control, essentially, this language of power, and also the prevailing fashion for recreating historic styles. Um, the arts and crafts practitioners really were not interested in trying to recreate something historic. They wanted to uh, create something completely new, complete, completely contemporary. Um, and it was against this backdrop and also a real distaste for kind of the pomp of the industrial age and also the associated devastation of the historic and vernacular knowledge and building techniques and materials that came along with this. Um, so, you know, the Gothic revival in one sense is a you know, celebration of the past but in another sense, it's actually real destruction of the past. And that's something that Philip Webb um, and William Morris could not abide. So arts and crafts architecture, in contrast with what you see here, is altogether more quieter. It's more authentic. Uh, it's supposed to be more domestic. Most of what I'll show you are, are houses. And it's altogether more sort of heartfelt. It's, it's more personal. Next slide, please. Next. Yeah, lovely, thank you. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, arts and crafts architecture had real ecclesiastical emphasis um, and uh, many of the arts and crafts buildings that you will see around London are, are still ecclesiastical buildings. This was mainly the influence um, um, of uh, AWN Pugin, who was an architect, he was a convert to Catholicism, and he saw in Gothic, um, or what he was called as pointed architecture, as in there's lots of points to it, very spiky, and he saw in this the truest expression of Christianity. There was also a real flurry of church building in the 19th century, and this provided a very lucrative source of commissions for architects and also makers of ecclesiastical furniture, you know, all the things that go inside a church. Um, and actually Morris and Co, when they were setting out um, in the 1860s, this was a really, um, a really lucrative source of commissions for them. So what you see here on the left, it's a frontispiece uh, for a book by Pugin, Apology on the Revival of Christian Architecture in England, uh, showing this you know, scene with all these spires you know, stretching up towards the heavens. Uh, and then there's a chalice also by Pugin. Uh, he also you know, designed interior decoration. There's a piece of ecclesiastical stained glass by William Morris. And then uh, on the bottom, there's two churches, fairly chosen at random. This could have been many churches. Um, the one on the left is St. Matthias Church. This is at the end of my street. I see it every day. And it's a huge example of early um, architecture in this kind of Gothic slash arts and crafts style by William Butterfield, who was a, a big influence on Philip Webb. And on the right, uh, considered you know, one of the finest arts and crafts churches in London, it's St. Augustine's, which is over in Kilburn, if that's a bit closer to you. Next slide, please. So where is the turning point for all of this? You know, so there's, there's no, of course, point at which the Gothic revival turns into arts and crafts architecture, but I'd suggest a catalyst for it was the meeting of William Morris and Philip Webb, um, both young men working as trainee architects in the offices of George Edmund Street, uh, architect of the law courts uh, in, in Oxford in 1856. Um, Morris originally thought he was going to be an architect. He wasn't temperamentally suited at all to this kind of work. It was too kind of uh, painstaking. It was too, he didn't have the concentration for it or he didn't have the, you know, the, the sort of uh, meticulous attention to detail that was required. Um, and so he gave up. And part of the reason he gave up was also because he was frustrated with the fact that in, in this is a quote, you couldn't get into contact with it. It had to be done at second hand. So this relates back to what I was saying about arts and crafts movement being all about, you know, handcraft and seeing a, a project through, you know, with your own hands. And you can't do that, of course, with a building. Philip Webb, on the other hand, was um, a fantastic architect and he had all the, the diligent, sort of patient uh, temperament, um, much more considered, much more sort of, you know, slow and steady than Morris. Uh, and he became essentially the father of arts and crafts architecture. Next slide, please. And so this is where it all begins. Um, this is technically Greater London. Um, it's in Bexley Heath and this is Red House, uh, which is owned by the National Trust. And this is um, known as the first arts and crafts house, essentially. It was the first commission that Webb undertook uh, and it was a family home for William Morris and his new wife, Jane. Uh, they'd married in 1859 and they went on to have two, two daughters. Um, and Red House is essentially a manifesto for the various architectural principles that Webb refined over the following 50 years. 
And you might notice some similarities with the Gothic architecture I showed. Um, you know, it certainly has, you know, these sort of slightly pointy, pointy roofs um, and, you know, sort of, there's a slight similarity. And Morris said it was medieval in spirit. But crucially, this is really pared down, it's simplified, it's domesticated, and it's suitable to its surroundings. It's very much medieval in spirit rather than medieval in design. Um, you know, it's not supposed to be a replica um, of a medieval building. It's supposed to sort of channel the spirit of the Middle Ages, but to create something new, something contemporary um, that, you know, it does not have, it's not an anachronistic reconstruction of something old. Uh, it's something that, you know, stands in its own right and it's actually very fresh, very modern. So uh, next slide, please. So as I said, arts and crafts architecture can be considered a collection of principles um, more than a catalogue of styles. So in the next five minutes, I'm just going to very quickly go through some of the key attributes that lead um, arts and crafts architecture to be considered works that are made up of essentially, well, the quote is heart, honesty and humanity. So principle number one, Form follows function. Um, Webb was very keen, as were other arts and crafts architects, that a building's use dictated its form. So instead of, you know, for example, a Georgian box building that looks very regular on the outside and then the inside is dictated by that, um, the, the Webb and other arts and crafts architects thought about the floor plan first and then they thought about the design of the building afterwards. So it's very much function, use, and then how that fits into the outside world. Uh, next, please. Principle two, honesty of construction. So for arts and crafts architects, structure is beauty and beauty is structure. So they, the two are not divisible. Um, you know, the structure of something is why it's beautiful. And this really comes across in design drawings for the movement. So. Other architects at this time would do these very um, fancy presentation drawings. So what you see here on the left is a presentation drawing um, showing the design for this fountain, medieval style fountain. Philip Webb never did anything like this because he felt that it was not real. He said that presentation drawings, um, you know, picturesque uh, sketches were actually a fatal gift for an artist because it showed a kind of uh, unrealistic representation of an idea rather than actually the beauty of what it would look like and so his drawings even the ones for clients are, are like what you see on the right they're practical they're functional and they tie aesthetics into construction next slide please number three is um Architectural unity. So the inside of a building and the outside of a building should work together. The interior of a building should also work. So you can see this is the inside of Red House. Um, and you can see that there are elements that are taken from the outside that are sort of echoed on the inside. Um, there's this uh, exposed beams, there's the brickwork, and there's the beautiful wood. Um, and there's, you know, there's this sort of um, revealed construction um, that also kind of shows you the, the guts of the building, the body of the building. And it's not ashamed of that. Actually, it's proud of the building. Building as a as a structure that you can see from both inside and out. Next, please. Principle number four is that everything in a building should be designed by the architect. And this is where it becomes tricky because, of course, you have a huge building, very difficult to do that. Um, but what I'm showing you here is a London house. It's in Kensington. It's one palace green. And it was designed in this, uh, 1867 for the painter George Howard and his wife, Rosalind. It was a studio house. So it was part artist studio, part family home. There was a garden for the children. There was also a schoolroom for the children that was built later. And Webb designed the outside. Uh, and also he designed aspects of the inside, which is what you can see on the right, which was also um, worked on by William Morris and Edward Byrne Jones. So this was the house as a kind of a total work of art. Um, and this is something that comes across more and more in arts and crafts architecture. Very quickly to say um, that the uh, web, even though this looks very much like what we would expect architecture in West London to look like these days, he was um, really uh, like almost not allowed to build this building because it was, and I quote, monstrously ugly um, and hideous. And it was just, it was considered too modern. The brick was not right. It was considered just too um, ostentatiously plain, essentially, and not in keeping uh, with the local area at all. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another London house uh, and it shows um, principle five, which is um, integrity of materials and really careful consideration of building materials and sort of truthfulness to them. So the idea that you should build with materials that are 
um, in keeping with the local area. And also, you know, if something is made of marble, it should look like marble. If it's made of wood, it should look like wood. So this is a very typical design drawing by Webb that really lays out exactly what everything should be made for, you know, the type of marble, the type of concrete, the type of wood, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this was, you know, something that he always paid attention to, um, that, you know, the materials used in building should be um, in keeping with the area that it was the, the local area and in keeping with the function of the building. Next, please. Respect for craft skills. So um, Webb very much believed that architects should know how to make things um, and that, you know, you should have a lot of craft skills within a house. It shouldn't be industrially produced. Um, you know, it, there should be good craftsmanship, good work within the house. So Webb designed pretty much everything. So that includes woodwork, uh, stucco, decoration. He also was really proud of designing drains and he said he never was really proud of anything he did but a good drain design was something that he could really take pride in. Um, I don't have any pictures of drains because they're not that interesting to look at but this is a man who designs not only you know the wooden architraves around the interior doors but also you know the drain network and also the garden so it's you know it's, it's knowledge of how you make all of these separate elements and how you put them together. Next please. And key principle number seven, uh, design should be fit for the intended purpose. So these are um, some of my favorite buildings in London. They're near Liverpool Street Station and they are um, little houses and workshops and shops meant for artisans. Um, so, you know, with working from home has become a, a much more um, prevalent thing in the last year or so. And this was, you know, somewhere where artisans were um, able to, you know, create work um, in their domestic space and you know, have a super suitable um, building space for them. And this is a really nice example of the more modest, more humble, um, fit for purpose, you know, no frills buildings that arts and crafts architecture was actually all about. Next, please. And then the final principle is uh, repair, not restore. So um, this is something that really is important to our understanding now of um, buildings, but there was a lot of terrible restoration. Um, part of the Gothic revival was restoration of historic buildings. So what you see on the left is Victorian restorations to parts of the Tower of London, which actually destroyed original fabric of the building in order to make them look more old, except it was new, but it was supposed to look old. So Morris and Webb hated this um, this falsification of history, essentially. So they set up the Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings uh, in 1877. And what you see on the right uh, is correspondence to Philip Webb um, from one of the young architects he worked with about how to sympathetically repair a building. Uh, rather than falsify its age, its history, to kind of work with its history to, to create something um, that was was authentic and was real and was honest, essentially. So very uh, finally, um, I suppose what I would like you to take away is the idea that Morris said that architecture must be organic. It must fit naturally and sustainably with the needs of people and places. And I think it was this common sort of combination of common sense and invention um, and reality, so the, the demands of sort of practical reality that makes the arts and crafts movement and its architecture actually still very relevant for architects today, even when they're working in very different circumstances. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Rasheen, for a fascinating and I think extremely um, uh, brief but erudite uh, outline of what arts and crafts architecture is about. But I feel at this point I, I really should make reference to Ruskin and particularly the chapter in uh, The Stones of Venice on the nature of Gothic, which really does describe um, in the 18, early 1850s from memory um, this dilemma in um, the revival of Gothic, which Ruskin was, was a part of. Um, and he says in that, and I can't remember the exact quote, but the outward test of a Gothic building is the pointed arch. I mean, your, your point about the, the very vertical emphasis, but the true test is the state of mind of the work, or workman, I think is the word he uses um, in 19th century terms, uh, who was making it. And that really introduces the whole notion of why you might think about craft, why you might think about the working, the designing and making as being exactly the same thing. And I think that's something that informs 
uh, both the later Gothic revival, but also the whole of the arts and crafts movement. And of course, it was one of the texts that was read, not just by arts and crafts architects, but early English socialists as well. It was a hugely influential piece of work. Anyway, we may have time to talk about that later because we need to move on to our third speaker, who is Anna uh, Wender Zerniak, who is the curator of the uh, uh, Tatra Museum, uh, which has numerous outposts. And she has, I understand, been involved with the restoration or the reconfiguration of 10 or 12 of these outposts of the museum across the Tatra Mountains. But uh, she's going to talk today uh, from Zakopane, which is one of the uh, uh, locations of the museum, uh, but also, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the centre of the Young Poland movement. So we've moved from London, Roisin's uh, outline of arts and crafts architecture in London, and now we're moving to the Tatra Mountains and Zakopane. So Anna, please uh, to make your presentation. Może mi Pani pomóc? Share screen. I teraz co mam tutaj? Tak. To? Ah. Ok. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'll talk to you today about uh, Zakopane, the Zakopane style and the Tatra Museum uh, renovation project. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, Zakopane was a village of some uh, 2,000 inhabitants situated at the foot of the Tatra Mountains. Today, it is one of Poland's most popular tourist destinations, which over 3 million people visit each year. Visit, visiting the Tatra Mountains, Tatra region, only started in the first half of the 19th century, when just a few visitors, mostly researchers, reached Zakopane. Uh, they were followed uh, by people who were looking for respite from urban life. Uh, and one of the most important people who came here in search of respite was a well-known doctor from Warsaw. Titus Haubinski, whose first visit was in the 1850s. Uh, Dr. Haubinski was enchanted with the Tatra mountains and the local Highlanders, and he decided to settle in Zakopane permanently. At this point, a new chapter in the history of the village began. Haubinski drew attention to the local climate, which he believed was beneficial for the treatment of pulmonary diseases. At that time, many people suffered from tuberculosis. The doctor started to persuade his Warsaw friends and patients to go to Zakopane to improve their health. More and more people started going there, including many intellectuals and artists. And soon Zakopane became an important center of Polish culture. Poland did not exist uh, uh, as an independent state at that time. It was occupied by neighboring states and the region of Galicia in which Zakopane was located was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Galicia enjoyed much greater freedom than the other parts of partitioned Poland, and as a result, artistic, intellectual, and political ideas were able to be expressed more freely here. In the, in the collective consciousness of Poles, the Tatra Mountains have been and remain a cradle and symbol of freedom. In 1886, the village of Zakopane obtained the status of a climatic station, and this led to the first boom in Zakopane's development. Sanatoriums and boarding houses swiftly began to appear. In 1899, a railway line was built to Zakopane, which made the journey there much quicker, easier, and more comfortable. Its development continued dynamically. In 1933, the village was granted town rights, 
and Zakopane lost its charm as a small, quiet village forever. Up until the 1860s, the local Highlander the local highlanders were, were very poor and almost all of them uh, worked in agriculture and shepherding. However, they began to see in the development of their village an opportunity for an easier life and income. They began to expand their traditional two-room wooden cottages. They began to add rooms for paying visitors. Those who came to Zakopane admired the landscapes, but also the talents of local highlanders, their woodworking skills, crafts, and music. One of the artists who came to Zakopane in the hope of being cured of his land disease was Stanisław Witkiewicz. He fell in love with the Tatra Mountains and Zakopane at first sight. In his text about this place, he wrote about how impressed he was by the sight of mountain peaks and Highlander huts with half gable roofs. While walking around Zakopane, he admired the beauty of the local wooden architecture, while at the same time being shocked by the imported Swiss style of the newly, newly built guest houses. He wondered how it was possible that having such beautiful examples of already existing wooden, wooden Highlander architecture, developers chose to draw on foreign styles. He began to think about how to incorporate local construction methods and design in order to create a villa and guest house style that would be a unique native Polish style inspired by the local folk crafts, traditions, and materials. He managed to persuade a wealthy friend who had just decided to have a summer villa uh, built in Zakopane, not to follow the example of the already existing guest houses, but entrust him with a design of a villa in what came to be known as the Zakopane style. The friend had surely made a great leap of faith by entrusting the design of the house to Witkiewicz, who was not a trained architect, but a painter and art critic. Thus, in the years 1892-93, Koliba Villa was built and all its interior fittings and furniture were made. If we compare it to, the typical, to a typical Highlander cottage, they both are made of wood, feature a half gable roof, similar decorations, but Koliba Villa was on a much larger scale and with attic and more rooms. This is perhaps most visible if we compare the entrances to both a typical Highlander cottage on the left and the Zakopane style villa. Witkiewicz wanted not only the villa itself to be in the Zakopane style, but also its interior and furnishing. So soon there was furniture inspired by local design, dishes, lamps, clocks, and even curtains, cups, and paper knives. Today, Koliba Villa houses one of the 11 branches of the Tatra Museum, the Museum of the Zakopane style, which is dedicated, of course, to Witkiewicz. And this is how uh, the Zakopane style was born, which was a comprehensive style from the roof to the basement, from the bed to, to the cup. Witkiewicz promoted the Zakopane style as the first Polish national style based on native culture and native patterns. Poland was fertile ground for such ideas as at that time it did not officially exist as a state. Hungry for, hungry for freedom, Poles began to build houses in the Zakopane style, not only in Zakopane, but also in other parts of the country. The greatest uh, realization of this style was Dom Podjedlami, house under the firs, built for the distinguished patriotic Pawlikowski family. 
House under the first differs from Coliba Villa. It is much larger. The form has evolved a bit. We can see a roofed uh, staircase. The ornamental decorative work is richer and more elaborate, though it still remains in the same character. House, uh, house under the first aroused the admiration of visitors to Zakopane so much uh, so that when Poland was preparing for the World Exhibition in Paris in uh, 1900, it was decided to display a model of the house there. The model was built and crafted by local Highlanders, just like all Zakopane style villas, and it was transported to Paris. However, due to differences of opinion between the organizers of the exhibition, it was not shown to the public. Witkiewicz was very disappointed with this turn of events. The model returned to Poland and finally found its place as part of a permanent display at the Tatra Museum. Uh, since then, it has traveled abroad only once more in 2009 for our exhibition at the National Mountain Museum in Turin, Italy, where visitors loved it. And we like to think that Witkiewicz, the creator of the house and the model, would have been very pleased. If circumstances do not interfere, the model of this house will once again travel abroad this time to London for the Young Poland exhibition at the William Morris Gallery in October this year. Uh, the Tatra Museum has been in existence for over 130 years. Uh, the first museum exhibition was displayed in two rooms that were rented in a Highlander's house. Today, the museum consists of 11 separate historical buildings. Our primary task is to care for this cultural heritage. We have been undergoing a major project to restore our appropriate properties over the past six years. We managed to obtain over 30 million, sorry, 30 million zlotys, about 6 million pounds. Uh, from the funds of the European Union with support of regional authorities for an unprecedented renovation of nine museums in the Tatra Museum Network. Though this project is not easy, it has also been fascinating. Six of the monuments are wooden houses. In order to restore them in accordance with the original design, we entered in cooperation with local companies and craftsmen who know the details and nuances of construction and regional ornamentation. And this for me is the most amazing thing about this project, the cooperation on the one hand with specialists who know the contemporary requirements of administration and on the other hand, with Highlander producers of, for example, traditional uh, wooden roof shingles, uh, wood shavings used as an insulating material, floral wooden, uh, floral decorative motifs, and who acquired these skills from their parents and their grandparents and who know and care a lot about uh, our local heritage. At the Tatra Museum, we are, only a, we are only humble custodians of this heritage and of this tradition. At the Young Poland exhibition, which is due to open at the William Morris Gallery, you will have the opportunity to see a small part uh, of Tatra uh, culture. Uh, to finish, I would like to warmly invite you to the exhibition and also to come and visit Zakopane, the Tatra Mountains and the Tatra Museum to enjoy the unique landscapes and the culture of our region. Thank you for your attention.
can't hear. Thank you, uh, Anna, and thank you for a fascinating presentation of the um, work that you're doing in the museum and of the museum itself, this collection of, of historic, uh, historic buildings, uh, which typify, it seems to me, the uh, essence of what the Young Poland Movement was trying to extend and to uh, really, um, you know, capture and develop in some way. Um, so uh, again, thanks for that. And we should move on now to our next speaker, who is Julia Griffin, who again is, is one of the curators of the Young Poland Project, um, who uh, has uh, uh, studied um, uh, Poland and, and Polish art, and in, she studied in London, but uh, uh, has uh, an expertise in this area. And uh, she is going to uh, uh, talk Excuse me. Um, uh, she's going to uh, outline uh, some more about Young Poland and about the exhibition. So, Julia, please uh, take it away. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm delighted to be here today with my colleagues and welcome to uh, old friends and new friends who have joined us this evening. Uh, I'm going to um, introduce you to an arts and crafts designer, Karol Kosowski, and take you on a tour of his enchanting home of exceptional originality and quality. Um, next slide, please. Not much could be accomplished without supportive colleagues and Karol Kosowski's most helpful descendants. I hope some of whom are with us this evening, including uh, Ms. Ursula Bukowska, Mr. Jacek Bukowski, Mr. Zygmunt Kłosowski, and Ms. Natalia Kłosowska. Um, I hope you, uh, you, you, you can be with us this evening. Next, please. Uh, well, Karol Kłosowski um, was a, a, an extraordinary artist, designer, and master craftsman, and I couldn't possibly do justice to this highly original, um, to this highly original man. Uh, he was in fact one of young Poland's most original um, makers. His contribution to the young Poland movement and to the Zakopane art world deserves um, further investigation and largely overdue recognition. Our project, Young Poland, the Polish Arts and Crafts Movement, has begun that process. There are two chapters about Karol Kłosowski in our book, one about um, his uh, diverse creative output and another one about his home at Silent Villa um, as a total work of art. There are many levels of, of cultural significance um, uh, that, uh, that, that need further investigation. Uh, however, I can tell you that Karol Kłosowski was a polymath arts and crafts designer uh, whose, whose incredible versatility spanned furniture, master, wooden carvings, um, textiles, uh, including woven kilims, uh, lace designs, um, as well as paper cuttings and wall friezes. Uh, he, was an old, he was also an interior decorator uh, whose, um, whose work uh, extended to domestic as well as church schemes. Um, he was a, a painter. He was a photographer associated with pictorialism, which was a movement in, in photography which emerged in the 1860s. Uh, which aimed to elevate the status of photography to, to that of a fine art. Uh, he had a Mauritian genius for ornament, which, which I will expand on later on. Um, he was in fact a chief member of the Zakopane artistic community. He was, um, well, he um, worked for a couple of years for uh, Wojciech Brzega, uh, one of Stanisław Witkiewicz's closest collaborators, um, at Brzega's furniture workshop as a, um, as a designer. 
Uh, he was a co-founder of the Podhala Arts Society um, set up in 1910. The dual purpose of the um, Podhala Arts Society was to um, raise the standard of contemporary art, but also to, uh, to promote vernacular and folk art traditions. He was a, a co-member of the Kilim uh, Society uh, set up a year later. And uh, also he, he made a huge contribution to craft pedagogy in Zakopane, which was very much in keeping with the Home Arts and Industries Association in Britain. Um, he was a teacher at the Wood Industry Vocational School and also the creative director at the uh, School of Lace Making for over 20 years. And um, last but not least, given that his career span, spanned some 80 years, um, he can be considered as, as young Poland's last uh, artist. Next, please. Uh, in, in terms of um, Kosowski's uh, background, uh, he, he came from a peasant family. He was a half orphan and um, there, there, he had no prospects of a higher education. However, um, he was a child prodigy and because of his incredible talent uh, at, at drawing, um, he was, he was uh, lucky enough to study at the best vocational craft schools and art academies within the Polish lands as well as abroad. Uh, including the Kraków Academy of Fine Arts and also the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. And be, because of his background, um, at a very early age, he was exposed to traditional uh, f f forms of folk art, including um, the, the humble paper cutting uh, and also uh, decorating peasant houses with um, painted friezes wall friezes, uh, which became he became so good at that uh, from the age of 11, he was earning an income um, by decorating fellow peasants' houses with both the paper cuttings and the um, wall paint and, and the wall decorations. And um, in, in terms of um, uh, his, um, in, in terms of his um, ethos, uh, perhaps among all Polish makers, uh, he, he is perhaps the closest to the British ethos of cultural democracy and the British arts and crafts ethos of uh, cultivating vernacular traditions. Uh, Kosowski had a firm belief in the value of beauty uh, in everyday life and in everyone's right uh, to beauty. Uh, he also practiced the integration of, of all arts and firmly believed in the equality of all arts. Um, and he, he was very vocal about um, the joy of making, uh, frequently as a cure, of, uh, as a cure against uh, adversity. In fact, it was the humble art of paper cutting which uh, helped him recover from a teenage disappointment in love um, and subsequently from losing his wife uh, in 1915 and also during World War II when two of his children were uh, sent to forced labor, uh, Kosowski continued, um, continued seeking solace in the humble art of the paper cutting. And I've got just a couple of quotes for you to, to to be able to convey and, and share with you the philosophy of Kosowski uh, in, in terms of, 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 of his um, cult of beauty, he said, uh, pragmatism only serves the sustenance of a vegeta vegetative form of human existence. It is beauty which gives it fullness, dignity and worth. And in his capacity as the um, creative director at the School of Lace Making, uh, he said that um, the bobbin lace make making uh, not only provides the noblest delight through the joy of making, but also instills the, the cult of real beauty and ethics 
in Poles. So these ideas are very similar to the British ideas of, of Ruskin and Morris about the ennobling, um, ennobling effect of, of making. Um, next one, please. So here, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of the breadth, incredible breadth of Kosovsky's work. Uh, the handful of objects I'm showing you here um, are just the tip of the iceberg. So, uh, and also uh, they, they e exemplify his integration of, of, of all the arts in his creative practice. So on the left, uh, a wooden dresser uh, designed by Kosowski, made by Wojciech Brzega, um, customized with Kosowski's humble paper cutting of the peacock. Um, in terms of the style of this dresser, it combines um, vernacular elements from the Podhale region together with um, traditional elements from Podolia, which was part of the Ukraine where Kosovsky originally came from, uh, together with his own imaginative ornaments in the middle. Um, uh, uh, there are a couple of examples of kilims uh, made as part of the um, uh, <clears throat> uh, kilims made as part of the um, of Kosovsky's involvement in the kilim association and an altar frontal at the bottom. He also designed carved book bindings and uh, painted highly ornamental pictures, which frequently celebrated um, celebrated uh, the um, uh, ethos of handiwork. Next one, please. So, um, <clears throat> Kosowski originally came to Zakopane from Podolia uh, in 1896 as a 14 year old um, in order to study wood carving at the um, <clears throat> Wood Industry Vocational School. At the time, he lived as a lodger at, the, at, at a traditional vernacular Highlander guest house called Sobchakovka run by the Gonshinitsa Sobchak sisters. Um, he then left Sakopana and um, spent several years studying at the Kraków Academy of Fine Arts uh, and, and in Vienna, but with all the benefit of a cosmopolitan artistic, um, of, of exposure to a cosmopolitan art world, he chose to come back to the village of Zakopane in 1907, partly because of his bad health, he, uh, he suffered from tuberculosis, but also because he had fallen in love with one of the sisters um, uh, who, who had run the guest house, Katarzyna, um, who was a poetess, and over the next, they got married, and over the next 20 years, they embarked on the process of turning the humble vernacular hut um, with only two main chambers uh, into a total work of art. Uh, a conservation management plan uh, thus describes the process of turning um, at, at, at Sobchakovka, the traditional Highlander hut, uh, into what became Silent Villa. Uh, that was the name that, that, that Kosowski gave to the house. Uh, quote, uh, present day house was developed through enlargements and extensions from a traditional Highlander hut belonging to the local Gonsinica Sobchak family dating to circa uh, the beginning or the middle of the 19th century into a spacious family seat of the artistic Kosowskis. That process um, took place from uh, well from 1907 uh, until well into the 1920s, mm. and in this way, arguably, um, Kwasowski was able to live the rural idyll that William Morris was longing for at his vernacular 17th-century country house at Kamskot Manor, but that uh, in Oxfordshire. Uh, which Morris didn't get to experience because of his business commitments in London, 
uh, however, which Kwasowski was, was able to cherish uh, during his very long life. Next one, please. Uh, this is just a taste uh, of some of the, uh, I, I, I understand from my colleague that uh, we are running behind with time. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, give you a visual tour of Silent Villa. So this is just a taste of some of the ornamental features uh, 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 on the outside, including the traditional fence with the name Chiha, meaning silent, uh, made up of birch twigs. And then uh, in the in the middle in in the um, in the middle at the top, um, there's the finial at the top of the gable, which shows the head of Janosik, who was the good Highlander highwayman, uh, the good bandit. He was the equivalent of Robin Hood, and this is probably the only house in Poland with a sculpture of of Janosik um, as the finial. Uh, there's also a beautiful cottage garden designed by Kwasowski. Next one, please. As I mentioned to you, Kwasowski um, was, was also an outstanding uh, a, a pictorialist photographer. Here, just a handful of, of his own uh, views of his artistic interiors at Silent Villa. Um, his cult of beauty extended to literally each and every fixture and fitting. Each and every fixture that you will see through the rest of the presentation has been designed and handcrafted by Kosowski. In the image on the left, the structure you can see on the bench is, is no other than an ornamental cover for an electricity meter. So that just shows you um, that just like Morris hated modernity, uh, as, as did Kwasowski. Um, the next one, please. So towards the beginning of the, um, uh, to, to, towards, towards the beginning of the process of turning the, the humble Highlander cottage into silent villa, um, Kosowski turned one of the attics into an artist's studio. He created two dormer windows uh, in the north with northern light, which was also so important for British artists, and in the south. And in particular, I wanted to show you um, the beautiful carved door to the studio with the symbol of the spider carving its web, which is in fact a metaphor of Kosowski's own cult of handicraft, uh, well, his own practice as a decorative designer, um, and perhaps a, a more literal reflection on his work as a designer of lace. Next one, please. Uh, so here, um, uh, just a couple of details. So if you look at the tiled stove, uh, there is a beautiful detail of, of a painted frieze featuring um, grasshoppers, one of Kosowski's favorite motifs. And then on the right, uh, he has carved um, a cornice uh, in the shape of a, a, st a stemless carline thistle, uh, a, a local uh, othala plant. Um, next one, please. Uh, this is just, a, these are just a couple of views of the dining room. Again, all fixtures and fittings, the furniture, the paintings, um, the, the paper cuttings uh, decorating the walls, uh, in, uh, as well as the decorative arch, uh, which creates a vista into the artist studio uh, on the right hand side, have been designed and handcrafted by Kosowski. Next one, please. And another couple of details. Uh, so on the left, uh, a carved and hand painted cupboard, uh, uh, customized with paper cuttings. Uh, on top of it, um, the uh, part of, of a fancy dress for Cleopatra, the headgear of Queen Cleopatra, designed by Kwasowski for his wife. And on the right hand side, you can see a, a paper cutting uh, being used uh, to create a stained glass. Uh, um, st style of ornament um, in, in the doorway. Uh, next one, please. 
So I come to the, um, to the final section of my talk. Uh, I would like to, uh, to share with you um, just uh, one aspect of Kosovsky's incredibly prolific output, uh, the humble art of the paper cutting, uh, which was arguably uh, the most important aspect of his output um, in philosophical terms. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, well, as I mentioned, Kosovsky took up the paper cutting as a boy uh, uh, in, in his peasant household. Uh, he subsequently abandoned uh, this, this humble um, medium of art um, for, for over a decade. Uh, but after graduating from the Krakow Academy of Art and the Vienna Academy of Art and settling down in the village of Zakopane in um, 1907, uh, he, took up, uh, uh, he, he took up paper cutting again, initially to gratify his wife as a way of beautifying um, the family home. Um, however, in time, um, Kosovsky began to use the paper cutting as a form of a cultural politics of ornament. It came to signify uh, both a cultural democracy, everyone's right to affordable and accessible beauty within the home, um, as well as, as a way of sort of capturing a repository of traditional Polish uh, ornamentation and traditional Polish heritage in the aftermath of the partitions. And um, in uh, just a few years after Poland regained independence, um, Kosowski published a textbook um, in the art of the paper cutting in 1923. And he wrote the following, uh, the paper cutting has grown out of the basic human desire for beauty, out of the same motive as behind any other artwork created by people from more cultured social strata. In quiet, impoverished villages, in the drabness of life, the populace resorts to materials and making in search for joy and happiness. I strongly hope that in the present time of trying to recover our own style, on the basis of our own old models, castles, moss-clad manor houses and road, roadside shrines, we will create our own architecture. Similarly, the paper cutting is a treasure trove of characteristically Polish motifs, which will serve as the basis for creating rich local ornamentation already underway. So um, although um, Kosowski engaged in a number of, of media and traditions um, associated with folk art. He was not a folk artist. He was a very well-trained um, artist of the highest originality and, and, and uh, uniqueness uh, with, with, with an output of incredible uh, quality, but he chose to engage with um, folk art media as a way of practicing uh, cultural politics. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Julia. And what a fantastic artist he was. I mean, you know, as you say, a polymath, he was a, a, a fine photographer, designer, a maker, draftsman, uh, all those things uh, came strongly to him. And I think that house, Silent Villa, is really magnificent. But I also think some of the images in it queue up very nicely for our next speaker, Nicholas Tremens, um, because they showed how he might place paintings or uh, uh, paper cuts or uh, images of some sort within a very strong architecture. And uh, that is, I think, what uh, uh, Nicholas is going to talk to us about. Um, Nicholas, would you like to uh, start? Yes. How's that? Unless somebody stops me, I'm going to start. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jeremy. So um, I'm going to be pretty brief. 
Um, I've been lucky enough to be invited to take part in this event this, this evening uh, on the basis of a book that I've recently completed. It's called The Private Lives of Pictures, Art at Home in Britain in the 19th Century. Uh, it's not actually out yet, it's due out over the winter from reaction books. So it's about Britain. Uh, one of the themes I pick up in the book is the tension between the picture, which I define as a portable image designed for display, uh, usually a painting or a framed print, the tension between the picture on one hand and the newly self-conscious notion of the interior in Europe, but specifically in Britain in the late 19th century. The arts and crafts movement, broadly speaking, and of course I'm not going to uh, try to suggest that every arts and crafts architect signed up to the kind of ideas I'm talking about now. I'm just talking about a few of them, but it's a prevalent uh, a point of tension, I think, throughout the language and practice of the arts and crafts of this period. The arts and crafts had two fundamental problems with the picture. One was essentially political or ethical, the other was aesthetic. The first problem, the ethical one, was that in the words of Walter Crane, the great British um, designer, socialist, general progressive activist, in 1892, he complained, Crane complained that, quote, the vast general public have been taught to understand by the word art, chiefly that form of portable and often speculative property, cabinet pictures in oil. So Crane here and elsewhere complains that the whole language of art, the whole experience of art as it might be, architecture, place, space, nature, etc., has all been compressed into this commodity. In other words, he's talking uh, very much about what Marx felt when he was talking about commodity fetishism. And if you were to show the kind of interior to which our architects would have objected, they would have objected to this kind of thing. This is the, the landing at the top of the house in Liverpool belonging to Mr. Blackler of the famous uh, Liverpool department store photographed in 1916, where the wealth of the uh, owner is really shown off through the collection of pictures. Um, Lewis Foreman Day, one of the uh, foremost um, uh, designers of the 1880s and 1890s, wrote in his uh, book of 1881, Everyday Art, our reverence for a painting in oil has in it something approaching to superstition. How few persons think of adorning their walls with anything else. So again, this idea um, that the movable portable oil painting is, is wrong. Now, um, earlier, Rogin uh, gave us among her list, so checklist of the principles of the arts and crafts that the architect should do the whole thing. Uh, now, again, obviously this was a problem for pictures. If pictures are imported by a variety of different artists into a carefully composed interior, that is supposed to have been composed throughout by a single individual, the architect or the architect stroke designer, uh, then this becomes a problem. More broadly, outside of just of the question of the art practicing architects, theorists, writers, journalists, commentators, um, on this modern uh, cutting edge avant-garde kind of architecture, which again, as Rogin so clearly expressed, uh, with avant-garde and edgy, but at the same time deeply rooted in the vernacular and in, in the historical indeed this whole evening has been about that paradox perhaps, that is the paradox at the heart of the arts and crafts. Um, the, um, many of these people writing uh, on this, this new aesthetic, carefully self-conscious about the, um, uh, the interior, felt that um, the picture simply was a a uh, composition which was in tension with the interior when itself, the, the interior itself, wished to, aspired to be, promoted itself um, as a composition. One of the most read writers of this period, if not necessarily the most original um, or inventive, but certainly one of the most uh, widely read, uh, was Mary Eliza Hoyes, spelt H-A-W-E-I-S. This is where um, English turns out to be harder to pronounce than Polish. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, Mary Eliza Hoyes, who interestingly moved into the house of Dante Gabriel Rossetti on Cheney Walk in Chelsea after his death in 1882. So she succeeded personally into that um, fabled space of an artist in the 1880s. But um, in 1881, just before that, she wrote in this book of hers, The Art of Decoration, a room is like a picture, except I've forgotten the slide. She actually wrote, after all, when we shake off the fetters of association, what a ridiculous object is a picture hanging on a wall by a string. 
what connection has it with the wall color which it hides or with the lines of the panels which it commonly contradicts. So uh, she is prepared to call a picture a ridiculous thing. She makes the point um, that it, oh dear, there we go, that uh, the picture is simply in the way. Um, now, uh, she goes further in the book by claiming, this is again Hoyes writing in 1881, she claims a room is like a picture. Okay, many people have said that before. A room is like a picture. It must be composed with equal skill and forethought. But unlike a picture, the arrangement in a room uh, must revolve around to a point which is never stationary, always in motion, because it doesn't exist without the human presence, which itself is always dynamic and moving. Therefore, the keeping becomes a problem far harder than the color. So um, Hoyes here makes the rather conventional comparison between a picture and an interior, but wants to make the argument that the interior is superior. Now, if you look at some of the really sort of full on, no holds barred, uncompromising arts and crafts architects of, of our periods, um, such as Sidney Barnsley working in the kind of area of the Cotswolds, which Jeremy mentioned earlier, actually, as an interesting comparison to Zakopane. Uh, this is Sidney Barnsley's cottage that he built himself and his family. It's called Beach Hanger in the village of Sapperton. Uh, in the Cotswolds, you can see that there's no pictures at all under our definition other than two Japanese prints in the window recesses. I won't be going now into the whole question of Japonism, but uh, Japanese woodblock prints were considered to be uh, a different kettle of fish in the late 19th century because they were understood to be cheap and cheerful and made by hand. And so they gained a kind of exemption from the frustrations that many avant-garde architects or arts and crafts architects felt in regard to the picture. Now, here's a chap we heard about earlier. This is Bailey Scott. Now, Andre talked about how he was um, one of the British arts and crafts architects to have received commissions, uh, albeit unbuilt, in Poland. If you remember that slide of Andre's, a kind of um, fortress-like looking cottage, a kind of cottage blown up to look like a keep, that was Bailey Scott. And actually, Andre also mentioned this particular book uh, principal book of Bailey Scott, uh, who I think to be um, a bit cruel has been airbrushed in that portrait. I don't think he was always quite that handsome. Um, uh, but this is his book of 1906. Now, Stefan Muthesius, the great German historian of uh, the English house around 1900, claimed that it was Bailey Scott, um, one of the most prolific of the arts and crafts generation, who was the first to have realized, says Muthesius, the interior as an autonomous work of art. Well, that's a, a big statement um, that we may or may not wish to follow. But one of the reasons that he was perceived as such was um, surely his, Bailey Scott's, really explicit antipathy towards the picture, whereas much of the suppression of the picture in the arts and crafts interior was quietly done. They just had other things to do. They were more interested in fixed pictures, murals in uh, decorative work, the kind of scheme that was permanently embedded within the interior rather than, as Crane put it, the portable commodity of the picture. Bailey Scott was explicit in rejecting the picture under our definition of it, as my quote from his 1906 book, an alien in the decorative community, an alien in the decorative community, using language which is uh, rather difficult from that period of um, large immigration into Britain when uh, the word aliens would have been associated with that. So a, 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 a rather sort of provocative use of language. And indeed, uh, Bailey Scott's book, when reviewed in the Burlington magazine, a book, uh, a magazine, a journal, which then is now, of course, focuses very much on the super highbrow interpretation of the fine arts. It, the Burlington magazine, in a paper, an article called The Modern House and the Modern Picture, complained that the arts and crafts had been too successful in Britain that it had swept through the middle classes, that the arts and crafts had swept through suburbia, and that people like Bailey Scott were basically suppressing the work of art as had been traditionally understood, the painting, uh, not least as evidenced in the plates in that 1906 book, such as this uh, plate showing the dining room of the White House by Bailey Scott built near Glasgow, where uh, to quote again, the Burlington magazine, the only pictures are quotes, perched on the high mantelpiece or hung upon the frieze, the frieze, as you can see in the upper right-hand part of this slide. And they are the kind of thing, complained the Burlington magazine, that are no better than small reproductions of heads by Greuze, Jean-Baptiste Greuze being the author 
or the original author of that image there that's placed um, within the paneling, an artist who uh, was absolutely despised by um, um, forward looking uh, British East Eats of just about any period. And it almost seemed that Bailey Scott was being deliberately provocative by including an image such as that by Gerers uh, in his interiors. But um, of course, the world of the Burlington magazine and the world of Bailey Scott is a very highfalutin, very um, sophisticated, very top end debate. Actually, if you look at most of the houses built in Britain uh, from the 1870s onwards, they very frequently uh, not only uh, make space for pictures, but include an architectural feature that became standard in interiors uh, in, in many suburban houses, and many ordinary houses from the 1870s onwards, and that is the picture rail. And you can see the picture rail here, a good example of it in this slide uh, from the 1890s. This is a house of a wealthy Cheshire uh, fabric merchant. And if I just, just go on to the next slide to show you what a picture rail is, it's essentially a classical ideal. You imagine a frieze and then you imagine a molding on the wall, which represents the lower part of that frieze, the lower extent of that frieze. Um, you add a lipped timber uh, molding uh, using this uh, S-shaped hook from which you suspend your pictures. So actually for all the, the, the complaining of, um, of, of, of highbrow aesthetes that the arts and crafts risked um, reducing the picture uh, to nothing. In fact, uh, the picture was doing perfectly well, thank you, uh, amongst the middle classes. Indeed, the picture rail was doing so well that I would argue that certain arts and crafts architects, and I'm onto my last couple of slides, certain arts and crafts architects deliberately push back at the picture rail as an architectural element, which was itself suspect to them because of its obvious association with pictures, but which they nevertheless felt it necessary uh, to confront in their practice. Earlier, Andre mentioned, and indeed showed us a slide of the wonderful man Ebenezer Howard, the inventor of the idea of the garden city and in, in Letchworth garden city, north of London, sort of up towards um, Kettering, up towards almost Cambridge, uh, direction. The architects Barry Parker and Raymond Unwin, who worked as a partnership together, uh, filled that area with these wonderful um, small, uh, well, by middle class standards at the time, small uh, houses. And, and, and in them, we see this that general, perhaps, um, reluctance to consider spaces for pictures that in the book they wrote together, uh, they complained about. Uh, or rather, sorry, that they championed. They record in uh, a book they wrote together, this is Parker and Unwin, the architects of Letchworth Garden City. They recall uh, being confronted by a furious art dealer. I guess they could have made this story up. It kind of fits their narrative. Anyway, they alleged they were confronted by an angry art dealer who said to them, you, meaning you are arts and crafts people, you and those who follow your teaching are the worst enemies I have. I want people to have houses of the ordinary type that they may always be trying in vain to make something of them. Each of these rooms, i.e. <coughs> your rooms, Parker and Unwin's, is itself a complete and satisfactory whole. There is no temptation to add anything. And this was a big theme written about by many architects, uh, including Norman Shaw around 1900. This idea that um, actually, or imagine, in, in, in their imagination, art dealers were convinced that arts and crafts architects were going to do them out um, of the business. But the point I'm making here visually is in this um, house in Letchworth of 1906 or circa 1906, you can see that um, Parker and Unwin have indeed not only used the picture rail, but they've expanded it into a nice big chunky arts and crafts picture rail. And they've continued it pretty much all the way around the room. And they've made it feel as if it's part of a kind of half timbering exposed structure. Again, the Rogin uh, gave us as one of the principles of arts and crafts architecture generally. It is a picture rail. You can see a picture suspended, a picture of um, St. Paul's Cathedral, a view of London on the right. Uh, but it is a picture rail that announces itself as part of the fabric of the building primarily and only secondarily as a functional thing from which to hang a picture. And my final slide comes back to William Morris, which I hope is appropriate given uh, what we're all talking about this evening or looking forward to the exhibition of Young Poland at the William Morris Gallery. This is William, one of William Morris's other houses. This is Kelmscott House, not to be confused with Kelmscott Manor, Kelmscott House in London. 
And in it, uh, this is a house of the 1780s, which Morris took over a hundred or so years later. You can see he's used the picture rail or the molding, which more or less functions as the picture rail here uh, in the drawing room at Kelmscott House as, uh, uh, as a molding from which to suspend not pictures, but a fabric, indeed one of his own fabrics, bird, this beautiful woolen uh, woven fabric, and indeed largely, very crudely speaking, and I know there are great experts both amongst the speakers and I'm sure amongst the audience on William Morris, so I'm really not gonna pretend to have much new to say um, about William Morris, but I'm just making the point about how the picture rail is, it seems to me deliberately repurposed here. There is a picture, there is a picture in our definition just in the photograph by Emery Walker, taken in 1896, the year of Morris's death. It's a copy, I believe this is what we're looking at. We're looking at um, Fairfax Murray's copy after um, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's um, Water Willow of 1871, the original in Delaware, the copy now at Kelmscott Manor, appropriately because that's the property shown in the, in the background. But the point I would make here is that uh, um, someone like Morris so um, attuned to, indeed, as again, as Rogine and others have just pointed out this evening, pretty much the founder of the arts and crafts, feels it necessary to show by example how to replace the picture, not to eliminate it. Uh, very few arts and crafts architects wish to eliminate pictures altogether, not even Bailey Scott uh, wished to do that. But in the case of Morris, we find the picture firmly put in its place. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nicholas. A fascinating uh, description of the dilemmas that were posed to arts and crafts uh, patrons, uh, designers, and art dealers about how you deal with uh, pictures in an arts and crafts interior. Now, I'm very conscious that we're running over time a bit. So if you feel you have to leave, please feel free to do so. Um, after all, it's not quite like uh, getting up and walking out of a lecture hall when you're in a Zoom meeting. So. Uh, but we do have now uh, a very important message from uh, uh, Lucy Clark of the publishers Lund Humphreys, who is going to, uh, in a recorded uh, video, explain the importance of the Young Poland book, which they published, to uh, as a publishing phenomenon. And it's important for another reason. One is that during this uh, display, there will be the code uh, that you can use to get a discount on the book. Uh, so if you are interested in buying it, do watch the, the video and make a note of the code. And also because you may now uh, put uh, start to type questions. Now, I'm going to have to have a very short question session after the, uh, uh, the book presentation, the publisher's presentation. Uh, but we will try and take one or two questions, but please try and make them as interesting as possible, uh, because that will keep everyone's interest up. Uh, while we're running over time. But perhaps we should move to the message from the publisher. Hello, my name is Lucy Clark and I'm the commissioning editor at Lund Humphreys. I'm delighted that the Young Poland movement is forming part of the discussions being held during the London Festival of Architecture. And I'm sorry that I can't join you tonight in person, but I'm really pleased that modern technology means that I can take part. I first started talking about the Young Poland Project with Rowan Bain of the William Morris Gallery in December 2019, and I was immediately struck by the originality of the project and was keen to find a way to acquire it for the list. A list which is perhaps most associated with modern British art, but actually has been broadening its reach in recent years and now incorporates a strong seam of architecture and design books. This coupled with an interest in 19th century subjects, for example, our 2016 book, The Diary of Mary Watts, which Nick Tromans is very familiar with. Uh, more recently in 2020, our books on arts and crafts churches. And most recently in February 2021, we published The Arts and Crafts Pioneers, which accompanies a show at the William Morris Gallery currently running. So all in all, I felt that it was a good fit with our aims and objectives and was keen to continue our discussions. Not least because the project itself represented an opportunity to 
publish something really pioneering and original, something a publisher is always keen to do. Also, it presented the work of a collective of experts in the field, so it was clear that the scholarship was robust. And also of appeal was the contextual information. So how young Poland was located next to the British arts and crafts movements, but more broadly, the historical and the political context of the movement. And with a wealth of beautiful imagery too, it seemed like an obvious acquisition. I've been asked to select a favourite image from the book, which as I flicked through it again this morning, felt like an impossible task. So I thought back to when all the imagery came in originally at the start of 2020 and remembered one popping up in my view that particularly intrigued me. And that was the devil Christmas tree decoration which is found on page 205 of Young Poland and was created in 1921 for the Krakow workshops. Designed for the consumer, but also created as a template for home assembly, this bold, somewhat cheeky devil encapsulates the arts and crafts ideal of craft and making, and by extension, the design process itself, an idea that points to modern industrial design. So, like many stunning works reproduced within the book, it demonstrates how groundbreaking the Young Poland movement was and why it should be celebrated and discussed. We hope that this is an ongoing discussion and that the book remains part of the conversation for many years to come. With one reprint already under our belt, it's clear that there is a ready and willing audience for all that Young Poland has to offer. Thank you. Thank you. We now have another video which will have the discount code embedded within it. Uh, so perhaps we could show that. Well, uh, a, a absolutely wonderful book, I think, and, and uh, a very, very good compliment, I think, to what we've uh, discussed this evening. And of course, we'll flesh it out, uh, flesh out the subject very much more than we've uh, had time to uh, this evening. So uh, I'm sure it will be worth buying. But I think also the exhibition um, in October will be very worth going to. 
Uh, and of course, there are other books that cover uh, similar subjects. Um, uh, Nicholas Trayman's book, uh, which is uh, called The Private Lives of Pictures, which is to, due to be published is it later this year or over the, over the winter, so within the next calendar year at least, uh, which will, I think, expand some of the fascinating points he made. But without um, uh, wasting time, I'd, I would like to uh, come on to uh, some questions um, and I'm uh, not sure whether we have any questions from the audience. So please, if you want to do something, use the chat section as quickly as possible. But I think there's one quick question I'd like to throw out um, to uh, perhaps any of the speakers, which is really about the importance of publications in the arts and crafts movement itself, but also uh, in Young Poland in particular, because in the 1890s, so just as Young Poland is getting going, you get the emergence of a number of new magazines fortified by the new technology of being able to reproduce uh, photographs quite well. And they include the studio, which we've just seen mentioned in that last video, uh, Country Life, which uh, published many of the great arts and crafts houses, and uh, the Architectural Review, which also published many of the great arts and crafts buildings uh, as well as houses. And I just wonder quickly if any of the speakers would like to say something about the significance of publications, perhaps particularly in uh, stimulating discussion about these issues in Poland. Well, um, I, may, I may answer it very quickly. Uh, by all means, this was the main career of the information that was very, very efficient and, and very quick and very well distributed, very quickly and very well distributed. I mean, most of the, most of the institutions or even private, uh, private uh, architects um, were actually subscribing to the studio. Uh, besides, I think the studio was the key, was the key factor. And you can, you can in principle, uh, combine it to the mass media effect uh, because uh, it reached them very, very quickly. Uh, high quality photographs, as you said. And what was amazing for me is that the, the studio held correspondence in all major cities in, 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 in continental Europe. So actually the information were going there and back. So you would, you would find a number of reproductions about Polish artists and Hungarians, Slovenians and others, of uh, Italians in, uh, in England too. So, uh, in fact, uh, I came across the uh, subscriptions of the studio in numerous also institutions like the Museums of Applied Arts. And there's one great story about the Viennese, Viennese um, uh, writer Petel Altenberg who wrote about a, a standard Viennese middle-class family who sits in the evening in their large uh, flat and the, the, the wife is actually browsing through the studio and it was almost like a standard scene that the, the looking through the publications about art was a part of the you know, cultural life of the Viennese elite. And that was get going on whole central, central Europe. Good, well, thank you very much for that. I think, I fear we're going to have to uh, draw a close uh, to the evening. We've, we've run over, as I've said, uh, we've had an absolutely fascinating series of presentations and very, very rich ideas, uh, which make me think, um, that everyone should really go to the William Morris Gallery and see the exhibition where you'll be able to engage directly with the objects that we've only seen on the screen this evening. And I'm sure the William Morris Gallery will be organising events programmes where there will be an opportunity to discuss it. Perhaps Rasheen or Yulia, you would like to say just a very few words about, uh, about an events programme you may be organising. Yes, absolutely. There will be an events programme. Um, as ever at the moment, it's a little bit, we don't know whether we'll be doing it sort of hybrid events or in-person events or online events, um, but there will certainly be a programme. Um, there will be an academic conference, there will be study days, and there will also be more kind of hands-on demonstrations of, you know, the craftsmanship of, of young Poland, um, things like paper cutting, that sort of thing, um, events for children. There'll be a family trail around the exhibition as well for, for children to visit. So there will be a packed um, um, events programme um, but we'll just have to work out, uh, you know, in the next few months exactly how that's going to look. Well, thank you very much. And I think that will add again another layer to the richness of, of, of the interpretation of, of the material. Um, so I'd just like to conclude then by saying thank you to all the speakers, to Andrei Shevy, Sipchewski, Roshi Ningleby, um, 
Anna, who I don't know if she's still with us, Anna Vender Simiak. You have to go and close her museum. Julia Griffin and Nicholas Trevins for a fascinating series of presentations. I'd also like to say thank you to the uh, to, to the uh, Polish Culture Institute, to Natalia Pocheska, and to Polish Hearth and, and Thomas um, uh, Amashka uh, for uh, running the technology so smoothly uh, this evening. And thank you all for uh, listening, and I hope you all have an opportunity to see the exhibition. Thank you.